the book of Matthew. And I uh, want to look at some things about Matthew and uh, about rightly dividing. Uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to read, uh, well, you can turn there too. We'll be re reading uh, in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I think Romans chapter 11, verse 13, y'all should have this memorized. It's one of the greatest verses in the Bible, and yet it's one of the most neglected and people don't realize what it is Romans eleven thirteen. for I speak to you Gentiles and everyone in here is a Gentile you are a Gentile for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles I magnify my office. If Paul magnified his office, then so should we. Now, I want to just say right here, we don't follow the man. We don't follow his ministry. You can't follow his ministry. In the book of Acts. Turn to Acts 16. Acts 16. And we're just going to have a simple Bible study today. Acts 16. Of course, you know how that goes. Acts 16. Now notice in verse 1, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, which is Timothy the son of a certain woman which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him, Timothy, would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews. He re he took him and circumcised him. Why? Because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. So he performs a Jewish ordinance on him. Because he recognized his father was a Greek. Well, we don't circumcise today. Paul did. The question is, he did it because of the Jews. Uh, but look over in Galatians. Now we'll get to Matthew. But look in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2. And notice what he says here. Verse 1, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Now, you know, it's always fascinating when you read about these things. Why would Paul need to tell the twelve or Peter, James, and John, the pillars, why would he need to communicate to them the gospel that he's preaching if they're all preaching the same gospel? I mean, why would he have to do that? Because he wasn't. Notice what he says, unto them the, uh, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them who were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither 
Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that, because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy on our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. In other words, there was some people, well, in fact, let me, the Scriptures uh, explain it. Look back in Acts 15. In Acts 15. And notice what he says in Acts chapter 15. And here's the brethren that came in privately to spy out their liberty and all the things, all this. He said in verse 1, Acts 15, 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be, what? Saved. Then circumcision, they were adding circumcision unto salvation. And Paul, he said back in Galatians, he gave space. I mean, he wouldn't budge on it. He did not have Titus circumcised. He would not do that because they were forcing him to do that. Now look in verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about that question. And what you have in Galatians chapter 2 is them going up to Jerusalem and they're discussing circumcision. And Paul saying, as my gospel does not include all of this. It has nothing to do with works. And he would not give. Look back in Galatians 2. Should have told you to hang on there. Uh, he said in verse 5, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. They, If they had submitted to these people and added circumcision as part of the gospel and as part of being saved, then they would have submitted unto them, they would have been in subjection unto them, and they would have controlled them. And Paul said, no way this is going to happen. And folks, that's what all of this is going on in our country today is about control. You do know that, don't you? And someday in the future there will be a man that he will control the masses. And he's called the Antichrist. And one day he will come on the scene when the body of Christ is gone. Now I want to talk to you, and let's go to Matthew. Paul's your apostle. Paul was preaching a different gospel than what the twelve would preach, and Paul's gospel has nothing to do with circumcision. It has nothing to do with water baptism. Sorry. <laughs> Turn with me to Matthew, and I want to start there. Matthew chapter, and it's already, man, 20 after. All right, look in Matthew chapter 7. I want to use this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works. The name of Jesus now. In thy name. So they're religious works. They're religious people. Then will I profess unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me ye that work iniquity. Then the works that they're doing. Is iniquity. The works is religious works. 
Works is what people trust in. Look with me and hang on to Matthew and come over to Luke and look in Luke 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Luke 18, verse 9. And he, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. What they do? That they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into, up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood, he's proud, and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Boy, that's some kind of attitude, isn't it? Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Now I hope your attitude ain't you don't look over and say, God, I thank you I'm not like so and so. I fast twice in the week. There's his works. I give tithes of all that I possess. And boy, you could add to that list of religious works that people do. And they trust in them works. They're not trusted what the law, they're trusting in themselves that they can perform deeds that will be good enough for God to let them into heaven. And how many times have I heard people say that I'm trusting that I have enough good works that my good works will outweigh my bad works. And folks, people's going to end up in the lake of fire with that kind of attitude. Look what this old publican did. The publican standing afar off, he wouldn't even come, he wouldn't even approach. He said, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased. They exalt themselves in their goodness. They're proud of their goodness and their good works or their system that they're in. They're proud and they work for those systems. And they're accumulating but you know what? They're not accumulating the good works of rewards. But look what he said. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now I use that to show people today their attitude. Their attitude today is the same as this Pharisee. They trust in what they're doing. But turn to Romans. and Hang on to Matthew, but look in Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2. And notice what Paul says about the people. In Romans chapter 2. Notice in verse 4. Romans 2, 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, Repentance is a mind change. Do you know the first mind change a man, woman, boy, a girl, whatever, has to have before God will ever save them? They have to change their mind about who they are. Well, who are you? You're a sinner. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. You are a sinner. You were born in sin. You have a sinful nature about you. And that nature is a rebellious nature to God Almighty and to His gospel. And folks, until people repent of who they are, change their mind about them, they'll never be saved. 
God came into the world. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save what? Sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the righteous. He died for ungodly people. He died for his enemies. He went to that cross and he died for sinners. And he became what you are. And you're a sinner if you're living today. Now, I don't care what your pedigree is. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what you were doing while you were there. And I don't care where you're headed. I'm telling you right now, you're a sinner and you need a Savior if you don't have one. And your good works will never save you. But look at the verse. He said there, the repent leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impented heart, what are you treasuring up? You're treasuring up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. These people that are doing good works in the name of Christ, in the name of religion, and they're trusting in that, they're going to get the wrath of Almighty God someday. Folks, there's only one way to the uh, life, and that's through the cross. Jesus Christ went to that cross. And he hung on that cross. And they nailed him between two thieves on that cross. And he became sin for you. He, the Bible said that God made him to be sin for you. Boy, isn't that wonderful? And every sin... Your past, your present, your future, Jesus Christ died for all your sins. Every one of them, they're paid for. And not only that, He took them away. And, died, and God had to forgive His Son in order to get Him out of the grave. And on A.D. 33, Jesus Christ died the sinner's death and went into hell and suffered for you and the God poured His wrath out on His Son in your behalf. And He's your substitute. He's the one that God judged for you. And you think that God would let somebody into heaven on their goodness when Jesus Christ suffered like He suffered and God judged His Son instead of judging you and God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Folks, don't you realize that God's Son became what you are and and God judged him instead of judging you. And you want to try to get to God some other way? Why, well, folks, God will stick people in the bottom of hell and laugh at them while they're frying like a ball of sausage. The Bible says in Psalm 2 that he'll, he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh at their calamity. He's going to laugh at them. Do you know what that laugh is? It's a laugh of scorn. But let's go on. I want to talk to you about something. Look in, come on down in Matthew 7. And by the way, he says that them good works that they're doing, they're works of iniquity. They're unrighteous works, even if they're good works. Notice in verse 24, Therefore, that verse, that word, therefore, connects with what he's talking about, that judgment. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which buildeth his house upon a rock. Now that rock is Christ. You want to see it? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I know people say, well, there you are. You Well, of course I'm using Matthew. I can make spiritual applications out of any passage in the Bible. 
as long as they're in line with what Paul the Apostle says. But look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and notice what he says there. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now he's talking to some Jewish people there because my fathers wouldn't have been in that crowd. My fathers would have been one pushing them into the sea. My fathers would have been the one chasing them. But here he goes. Now look on verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink of the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was who? Christ. Alright. There's a rock. And that rock is Christ. I want you to see. Come on down with me. Well, uh, you notice he said, a house built upon a rock. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine doeth them not shall be likened unto the foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Now, a rock in the context, he said, let me just finish reading, verse 27, and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds uh, blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. What is the foundation of that house? You got a house that stood, the storm, it's, it's built on a rock, that's the foundation Right or wrong? It'd be a fool to go out here and start laying your block or your building or your brick and laying them on just ground and without digging a foundation and pouring it and where it would have a firm foundation. This building is on a foundation. This walls is not struggling to stand up. They're resting on the foundation. That foundation is a rock. That rock is Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now Catholicism tells you that Peter's the rock. Well, Peter ain't no foundation. You can't build nothing on Peter while he denied the Lord three times. You can't trust Peter. Christ is the rock. Matthew 16. He asked them, Who to men? Verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, said, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you see that? Then he said that thou art the Christ, the Son of and I'll just put of God. This is ass. Come down with me. He said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, who revealed to Peter who Christ was. God the Father. So God the Father. Now look at him. Look what he said. But my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18. And I say also unto thee. Who's thee? Peter. 
All right, I'm just going to say, I'll just put Peter. He's the thee. I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this, what is it? Rock. What's a rock? And what is a rock? A foundation. Now this is not... We're not building a rocket ship to go to the moon. This is not rocket science. This is simple ABC stuff. Look what he said. Upon this rock. Is he talking about Peter? No. This rock is what the revelation that God the Father gave to Peter. Peter had a revelation from God the Father, and that's the rock, and that's the building is built on that rock, the church. He said, verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee, who's thee? Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, folks, there ain't no doubt about it. God the Father gives Peter a revelation. And that revelation is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that's the rock that that church is built on. Right or wrong? Am I, tell me if you think I'm wrong. So, here we are. So this is a church. Who's the head of this church? Peter. He's got the keys. All right? Now let me show you how this worked all through here. Now look, oh, let me go up to verse 21. Now they've been preaching back here three years. Some more around there. Look in Matthew chapter 10 before we go, and we will go to 21. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent forth, commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and to any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but, rather, uh, go, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Was they going to all the world? No, sorry. Verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come back to verse, chapter 9. In chapter 9, Verse 35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. They're going around, Jesus preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom. And he sends his twelve out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Come to verse 20, uh, chapter 16, verse 21. And by the way, you would think if you heard evangelists today, you'd think Jesus Christ and the twelve were setting up a big tent everywhere they went and had, trying to have tent revival. Look in verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should, that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Isn't that something? Here's God, Peter gave Peter, I mean, God gave Peter a revelation. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then the Son of God says, but don't you tell nobody. Verse 21, from that time began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third uh, day. Then Peter took him and said, Praise God, Lord, I'm glad you're going to the cross to die for my sins. He didn't say that, did he? 
He then Peter said, uh, took him and began to rebuke him, said, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. What shall not be unto thee? This right here. There ain't no way they could be preaching the same gospel, folks. Turn to, look on with me. Turn over to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And by the way, he's up there on the mountain. He's talking about them. And uh, talking to them. Uh, verse 1 and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. While he departs out from the temple, and the glory of God goes out with him. Come to verse, uh, many false prophets, verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That be saved from the wrath, end of the tribulation, or end of their life. Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel of the kingdom. That's what's going to be preached over there in the tribulation period, and the, by them 144,000 and the two witnesses and all. And he said, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, they understood what that was. That's what they'd been preaching all the time. That's what they told them to go and preach. That's what Jesus Christ preached, the gospel of the kingdom. They knew exactly what he's talking about. Then you come to Matthew chapter 26, and Matthew chapter 26, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, the sayings sent Matthew 24, 25 are the sayings. They're the same setting. No time elapsed except what the Lord talks to him about. And he said, Ye know that after two days the feast of Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. That's before the cross. Two days. Then turn to Mark 16. He goes to the cross. In two days he dies. And in three days he's raised. So five days later... He talks to his disciples again. Are y'all following me? Mark 16, verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Five days before he told them that, he told them to go and preach what gospel? Gospel of the kingdom. Now, folks, it ain't changed in them five days. And they go, and they're preaching. And Peter and them's preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5. They're preaching the gospel of the circumcision. And circumcision had to do with Israel. And it had to do, but anyway, I want you to go to John. The great book of John, the beloved John. Why is it written? John, look in John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Now watch how the foundation here works in this Jewish church. The church that Christ built upon this rock. The rock is Christ, the Son of God. It's the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John chapter 20, verse 30. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Folks, that the name is Jesus and the Christ is the Son of God. That Jesus was the Son of God. You know why the book of John was written? That these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now I'll ask you a question. Be honest. 
Can a man be saved today simply believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? No, he can't. During the trip, turn to Acts, look in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. I'm not going to read it all, but look in Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And Philip said, he asked him, said, Here's water. Can I what doeth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ died for all of my sins. No. Nope. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chair to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. That's the foundation of that church. They would get into the be water baptized for the remission of sins, not because of their sins that had been remitted. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And notice in Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 2, 38. They heard the message of Peter. And by the way, look back in verse 23. Acts 2, 23. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. And verse 37, they were pricked, uh, and heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Then verse 38, and they asked him, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. Change your mind about who he is. Change your mind about Christ. They thought he was a, a betrayer. They thought he was a liar. They thought he was a fake. But what did they have to do? They had to believe that He was their Christ, their Messiah, the Son of God, the one they crucified, Jesus. And look what He said. Then He said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Believing in the name of Jesus Christ is believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now look what he said. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now these people say, well, that's because. Well, you know how I know that that's for and not because? I think the spelling has something to do with it. It don't say because. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God, the Lord our God shall call. Now turn with me and look over in Acts chapter 3. He tells them again, they preaches unto them again, and he said in verse 15, and kill the prince of life whom God raised from the dead. He tells them that they kill the prince of life. Verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now look what he goes on. Come to verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 2.38 That for the remission of sins. Here they get blotted out. When do they get blotted out? They get blotted out at the second coming of Christ. 
Look what he said. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Paul gives you the interpretation. Romans chapter 11. Notice in verse 25. Romans eleven twenty five. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, under the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Their sins get taken away at the second coming of Christ over here. He comes down to this earth, sets up a kingdom on this earth. And, uh, and we just put a thousand years, and the Antichrist uh, in here is a time of what they call the tribulation we call it that's the time of Jacob's trouble he destroys the Antichrist they go into the kingdom we as the members of the body of Christ we go up to meet the Lord in the air this uh, is called the dispensation of grace and it was uh, appeared unto Paul over here in Acts chapter 9 and we gonna leave, it's going to end at the appearing of the Lord over here when He appears to the body of Christ. He is saved. In here, uh, I'm sorry, I, I got all this. This is not in here. This is back here and over here. But the, I'm just going to make it like this. In these two points here, is what is called the dispensation of grace. And we have, we're saved by grace, believing that Jesus Christ died for all of our sins. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm going to close. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And it's hard to get it all in. And... People ask questions and, you know, and watching on Facebook or whatever. And I'm glad she's done or whenever Robbie puts it on. But notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is really a two-parter. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now notice what he says here in verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Who laid the foundation for the body of Christ? Paul. What is that foundation? Anybody know? Turn to chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, also uh, ye have received, which also ye have received, wherein ye what? You stand on a foundation, don't you? By which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the foundation. This back here is the foundation given to Paul. Turn to Galatians and look in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. The word gospel means good news. He said in verse 11, 
But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just as Peter had the revelation from God the Father about who this uh, Christ was, that was the rock which that church was built on, Paul got a revelation from uh, the Lord that this is the foundation which this church is built on and this church is not the same church as this one is. Two different churches, two different doctrines, two different gospels, two different foundations and the two will never meet. And you can't get them together. Two different revelations. Everything is different. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And I, I told you I was going to close and I promise you I am. I promise. Sooner or later, he that endures to the end... Look in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first, also to the Greek. My friends, what's the power of God unto salvation here? The gospel. Your works is not the power of God unto salvation. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize. Hold the phone right there. Did Christ send the twelve to baptize? A little light from the class. Yes, he did. The Bible said he sent them. He said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now that's where they stop. They need to read the next verse. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall speak with tongues. In my name if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. If they take up serve, it will not bite them. They will not... Heard them? I mean, just go on and on. Them signs follow any of you that believe and were saved? Don't think so. Sure, but I didn't see no snakes or I ain't drank no deadly thing. I wasn't going to test it. I'm saved. But look on. Christ didn't send Paul to preach the gospel, did he? If the God baptism is so important, why would Paul say what he did the next verse? Look, I mean, uh, look back in verse 14. And I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Beside, I know not whether I baptize any more or any other. I mean, now come on. Now, did he count it important? He didn't even know who he baptized. He tried to remember and said, I don't even know who else I baptized. And, but the first statement that I, I thank God that I baptized none of you but such and such. How would you like the preacher that believed in that get up in front of his congregation and say, you know, folks, I thank God I didn't baptize none of you. You think that'd go over well? Why did Paul say, he said, for Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Why is that so important? Verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. How do you get saved today in the dispensation of grace? You get saved by believing the gospel of Christ. That is the power of God and the salvation. 
You get saved by believing that He died personally for your sins. And God raised Him for your justification. That's it. It ain't got nothing to do with being bad. That's the foundation how you get into the church. One pa I promise in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going we're gonna to close. I'm going to put up my notes. I ain't been using them anyway. No. I have. So, maybe not. Ephesians chapter 3. Talking about the mystery. And by the way, all of this is according to what? A prophecy. This is a mystery. He didn't God. Nobody knew about it. If the devil had known that he was putting the Son of God to death and God was going to use it for the salvation of you and me, he never would have had him crucified. He deceived himself. Ephesians chapter 3, whereby, verse 4, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is that mystery? That the Gentiles, like you and me, should be fellow heirs and of the same body with Paul and the others and partakers of his promise in Christ by water baptism. I'm sorry, I got a different translation there, didn't I? By joining the church? By good works? By what? The gospel. Foundation that Paul laid was the gospel, the power of God. Foundation that Peter laid was that Christ was the Son of God. John wrote his book. And by the way, 1 John 5, you'll find them talking about the same thing. All of this... Two foundations. This one included water baptism to get into that church. This one includes just believing. Wherefore, by one Spirit are you baptized into one body. And it's by the Spirit, not with the Spirit, by the Spirit. Okay, I'm going to let you go. Uh, stand to your feet, please.